Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. If you would turn in your Bibles this morning to uh, Matthew chapter 26, very long chapter. We're sort of taking the middle section this morning. Pastor Mitch did verses 1 through 16 last week. We'll pick it, be picking it up in verse 17. So we're going to begin by reading this passage this morning, 17 down to 46, and consider what the Lord has for us. So Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 17. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples uh, did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening had come, he sat down with the 12. Now as they were eating, he said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Then he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. Then as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this blood of the new covenant, which is shed for, the, for many for the remission of sins, I didn't think I read that right. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written... I will strike the shepherd and the, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go over and go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them asleep and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, he who betrays me is at hand. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Please lead and guide us as we walk through it. Please minister to us. Please be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. 
a lot to cover here this morning, and then we're only getting just to sort of this middle section. So keep in mind, we are in Passover week. Uh, we are most likely at this point on Wednesday night. Remember, the Jewish day begins at sundown or evening, and that is the start of their new day. So they're if you will, if you'd like to think of it this way, that roughly their 6 p.m. is what we consider our midnight. It's when their new day begins. And so uh, normally the Passover meal is eaten during the day on Thursday. It's, it's, it's sort of like, if you will, a holiday celebration for them as they remember the, the Passover. But Jesus is eating it on Wednesday night rather than during the day on Thursday with his disciples because he's going to be tried on the Passover. You see, he becomes our sacrifice. He becomes the sacrificial lamb of God on the day of Passover. And so as we uh, consider this this morning, there's a few things that I I saw as I was just kind of reading through this and praying. uh, Six things that I think we see here this morning to kind of guide us. First of all, we have the command in verses 17 through 19, as Jesus told his disciples to go and find that upper room. Then we have the sign uh, that uh, they would be given, which is verse 18. Then we have the betrayer in verses 21 through 25, which obviously is Judas. Then we have the Passover meal in verses 26 through 29. And then we have this thing that happening where, happened where Jesus uh, predicted not only Peter's stumbling, but all of them. So the stumbling in verses 30 through 35. And then the prayer in Gethsemane, or uh, if you will, the prayer in the press, verses 36 through 46. So the command, the sign, the betrayer, the Passover meal, the stumbling, and the prayer, all things that we are going to consider here this morning. So here in verse 17, now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus. These The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of the Passover were kind of merged together. And if we go back to the book of Exodus where the Lord gave the Passover feast to Moses, remember the Lord had been using Moses and Aaron going to Pharaoh saying, let my people go, but Pharaoh's heart became hardened. And you know that the Lord had sent the 10 plagues upon the people of Israel. And as he did that, He uh, came to that last plague, which was going to be where the angel of death came and passed over the land, and and the firstborn of every family was going to be taken as a sign of God's judgment upon the Egyptians for holding on to God's people and treating them harshly and abusing them. But then the Lord gave a a covenant to, to Moses, and he said, we're going to do this thing called the Passover. And he gave a very elaborate description of what was going to happen in the Passover. And they were to gather together in groups and houses. And as they gathered, he said, this will be the sign to you, to my children. You are to kill that Passover lamb and have it among yourselves. And when you kill that lamb and you go through the process of draining its blood... And of course, they would do that uh, outside the home. And a lot of times they would do it really on their front porch, so to speak. And so the blood would be outside the front door. And then they took the blood and they were told to take hyssop, dip it in the blood, use it as, as like a paintbrush and paint the lentils and the, uh, uh, and the, door, the lentil and the doorposts of your house. And if you're not familiar with these terms, the, the, the doorposts, of course, are the side pieces that hold up the door, and the lentil is the cross beam that goes across the top. And so they were to, to paint the blood across the top, the lentil, and down the sides. And in essence, if you were to superimpose a cross over that, you would see that the blood would be basically like on the head of the cross and on the arms of the cross, where Jesus would one day be stretched out, and then the lamb being killed there essentially on the front porch area would be where the feet of Jesus was. And as the blood dripped down from him, it would have been there. And so this was a sign that God gave them that was a foreshadowing of who Jesus would be, the the true lamb of God. But until then, God gave them a sign that if they would go in and they would worship him on that evening, that he, when he sent the angel of death, the angel of death would come and see the the blood applied to the doorpost and the lentils of their house, and he would pass over their home, and thus the term. 
And so they have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And normally when bread is baked, you, you probably know this, that, that yeast is used to cause that bread to rise. But they were told to bake unleavened bread without yeast. And so the bread would remain flat. And although today when we get it in our stores, we have these unleavened pieces. My piece broke on the way up to the podium here. Forgive my broken piece. Imagine it as one whole piece of bread. But as you look at this here, and if you've ever seen one of these up close, you see that there are essentially stripes on here as they pierced it so the air would be able to escape. And as you see this, and we come to the New Testament, it's so rich and replete with meaning. By his wounds and by his stripes, we have been healed. And the unleavened bread, you know, this is very close. It's not exact to what they did back in that day, but they would form the piece of dough, put no leaven in it, and then it would be flat. And then as they came to the meal, they would pick up the bread and they would break it and share it with one another. And we'll go through that as we get there. So on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and they said to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And so Jesus gave them that command and said, go into the city and the other gospels repeat pretty much the same story. And of course, you know, Jesus did this on other occasions where he sent the disciples in and said, you know, for example, on the day of the triumphal entry, you're going to go in and you're going to find a donkey tied along with its, its colt and you'll find it and loose it. And any, if anyone says anything to you, you'll just say the master has need of it and they'll release it to you. In a similar way here, he says, go into the city in a certain, and, uh, to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. The other gospels tell us very clearly, uh, when you go in, you're going to see a man carrying a container of water, a large water jug. And when you see him, follow him to his house and then tell him or say to him these words, uh, the teacher says, my time is at hand and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. You know, where is the guest room? The interesting thing about this command and this sign, as we think about it, is that on that, in that culture, uh, men did not carry the, the large water jars that held 20 or 30 gallons of water. Normally, and I know this is offensive to our 21st century ears, but normally that was woman's work. The ladies carried the water. You may recall John chapter 4, the woman at the well. Remember, she went out in, in the middle of the day at noontime in the heat of the day, not when other women went, because they often went, the women would go in the morning or in the evening in the cool of the day to get the water they needed for their household and for their families. But you remember that particular woman went out at noontime because she was a, a reject and an outcast because of her lifestyle, because she had been with over five men. She had been married and divorced several times. And of course, Jesus had a divine appointment with her on that day. But here, uh, Jesus says, you're going to go into the city and you'll find this man and follow him. So Jesus gave them a very specific sign. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. Uh, he gave them that command, they obeyed it. He gave them a sign, they saw it. And they followed this man and they spoke these words to him that Jesus told them to speak. And as they spoke these words, the man uh, opened his home and obeyed. And he simply opened this room. He says, I have a guest room here and it's all prepared and ready to go. And so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They prepared the Passover and when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. So again, keep in mind they're doing this really on the, a day early. So this is a bit unusual. And I, I wonder what this man must have thought whose home was being used to host this, how, how, that they were doing it a, a bit early. Uh, but they began to have this meal together. They, as so often was their pattern, they obeyed the word of the Lord. Jesus gave them an errand to do. He gave them a command, something that seemed a little crazy, a little out of place. And I'm, think, I'm thinking, you know, it's no accident really that we showed this video here today of Paul, of, of Pastor Paul, of what's going on there. You know, I, I know this man, I know him very well, and he's, he's, he's one of the many men of the faith that I look up to. And for him to say to us, you know, the Lord's been putting on our hearts to plant a church in Iraq. I kind of think of that like, hey, you're going to go and find a donkey. 
tied to a, a post, go take it. Or, or you're going to walk into a city and see a man carrying a water jar, follow him in and tell him we need an upper room in his house to have the meal together. There's going to be 13 of us. Tell him to get it ready. Hey, God's put on our heart to go plant a church in Iraq. You know, we need to listen to the voice of the Lord, don't we? We need to be in the word. We need to be praying. We need to be seeking the Lord. And if we are, God will speak to us. And he might speak something to us that seems a little bit out of place. Maybe it seems a little odd as it was in this situation. And yet the pattern in scripture is that those who had faith listened to the word of the Lord and they obeyed. We could go through multiple examples in the Old Testament of this, couldn't we? Of how the Lord told someone to go and do something and it was crazy, it was a little odd, but they did it. And as they did it, God had a plan, God had a way. You know, and so often in our lives, I know that this is true, it's true in my life, it has to be true in yours, we're people. We want God to show us the plan right? This is the way it works in business, right? We develop a plan and then we follow the plan. It's what we want to do in our lives so often, right? Before we do something, we want to get a little plan together, figure out what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, where's, where's the resources going to come from, what is the timing, when is all this going to happen? But I, I want you to know something that faith is often antithetical to logic. It's not that, that faith is illogical, but so often when the Lord speaks to us about things, as he has done in these situations we've just been considering, he lays something out before us, and we have to do it. I've been thinking about a lot of things sort of coming to the end of the year here, and, and, and one of the things I was thinking about, you know, we, we gather on Sunday morning. But I think in most of our 21st century uh, Western minds, most of us think is the first day of the week as Monday. Uh, we got to start the work week. Here we go. We start the grind again. We're all you know, looking for hump day, Wednesday, and we're TGI. we want to get to TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. But Sunday is the first day of the week, according to the scriptures. The pattern for the early church when the Lord uh, released his spirit to the church, and they gathered on the first day of the week. That was Sunday. That's, that's our tradition. And, and I, I'm saying this to say, I'm not saying this to guilt or shame anyone. I'm saying so that we all can recalibrate our thinking. Sunday is the first day of the week. You know, sometimes for us, it's the second day of the weekend. And we're, we're just trying to recover from what just happened, from the train that just hit us last week. And we're not even ready for the one that's coming this week. Listen, Sunday's the first day of the week. This is the day that the Lord has made. It's no accident that God has purposed that Sunday, the first day of the week, we should start our week with the Lord. And I say this to say that, and, and we're all human, right? We get up Sunday morning sometimes, today it was a weather event, but so often we get up and we're, I'm tired. I am, I'm exhausted. I don't want to go. I'll just watch it online or whatever. Listen, we need to recalibrate our thinking to what God says this is the first day of the week. We, we, get up, we give our first fruits to the Lord on the first day of the week. We give him our time, our attention, our resources. We need to obey the command of the Lord. We need to calibrate ourselves to who he is. We need to think not in terms of the world, but in terms of God himself and in terms of his scriptures. Sunday's the first day of the week. In this case, it was the first day of unle the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there's the command and the sign, the disciples obeyed. And then as we come to verse 21, <coughs> now as they were eating, he said, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. This is out of place. This is a feast of celebration, of remembrance. This is the very first feast God ever gave Israel. This feast was given to them pre-law. So they sit down, they begin eating, and Jesus says, uh, one of you is going to betray me. And no doubt they're looking at it going, what's he talking about? And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each one of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Now, here's the amazing thing. None of them, or rather, as we might think of it in our terms, you know, when we might think they all just go, well, obviously it was Judas, right? No. 
They all came, they, they, they didn't know. They didn't know who it was. And they understood, as we must understood, that the propensity is within us to betray the Lord. You know, in betraying the Lord, I always found this, so every time I read this passage, it's one of those passages that I don't like to read because it brings such conviction into my own life. And I, I think of it, maybe I'm just an extreme kind of a crazy person, so I'll, I'll bear my soul here this morning and you can recommend a good counselor afterwards for me. But I so often think about the situation of maybe the Christians of the first century and maybe being in a terrorist situation where they're holding a gun to your, your wife or your family's head and they're saying, renounce Christ or we're going to pull the trigger. Or in the first century, of course, uh, as they were torturing Christians, you know, renounce Christ or we're going to throw you to the lions. And, you know, none of us have been faced with that. We've never been tested in that way. I certainly have not. I would like to think, as I'm sure you would like to think, that if I were ever in, in such an extreme condition, that I would do the right thing, that I would say, no, never, I will not betray my Lord. I would never renounce his name or deny the faith. I will never say Caesar is Lord or the Antichrist for those who are one day in that situation, that he is king or he is God. There is only one king and his name is Jesus. This is a resolve we need to have in our hearts. But here in this situation, as Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. They, in, in the proper kind of humility, looked around at each other and they said, Lord, is it me? I mean, I haven't always been the greatest disciple. I've had lots of moments of weakness of faith. Lord, is it me? And he answered and he said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Now, the Lord's Supper, uh, as we call it, or this, this meal, the common uh, setting in that time, they would have a, a table in the shape of a U, and it was called a triclinium. And their tables were actually uh, just barely off the floor. You might think of a little kid's table, maybe about 18 inches or so tall. And their method would be, <coughs> they had pillows around the table, and they would recline back on one elbow. So essentially, they're laying on the floor resting on an elbow. But they're all facing the back of the person in front of them. And the way it works is position number one at the top of the U is um, the master, or, and he, he's the, the, head, the headmaster of the, of the feast, and, um, or excuse me, that's the seat of honor, and then the second one would be the master of the feast, and then the third one would be someone that they would be, be honoring, and as we've read these scriptures over time, we know that as they kind of go around, it's sort of you know, basically a rank in that situation, one through 13, and the one at the back end of the table is kind of the lowest rank of the people gathered. And as we study that night and we go through the upper room in John 13 and all of that, what we find is at the head of the table, the number one seat was John, then there was Jesus, and then there was Judas, and as you went on around, Peter was over in seat number 13. And so as, as we understand that, and they're all kind of on one arm leaning back and and we, uh, we read where Jesus and John had this intimate communication during the time of the feast. Uh, when Jesus says here in verse 23, he answered, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. We know that this is drawn from Psalm 41, 9, where he says, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me, my fellow commoner, my familiar friend. So there, that passage, you go and you read the psalm, and that psalm is, is very interesting. You read it in context, but here Jesus is saying, no, Psalm 41, 9, that was speaking of Judas. So in that moment, Jesus, as he reached <coughs> and got a piece of bread and dipped it in the sauce, which, again, to put it in our terms, is a bit like salsa and chips. He took a piece of the bread and dipped it at the same time as he did that. Judas was dipping. Some, some believe that what happened is Jesus dipped a piece and, and is showing an, uh, an act of honor that he gave it to Judas, you know, to, to serve Judas in that moment. The Son of Man is, is indeed, uh, the Son of Man indeed goes 
just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. We know that there would be a betrayer. The scriptures foretold of this, but Jesus is saying of Judas, it would have been better, it would have been preferable to have never been born. Non-existence is preferable to betraying Jesus Christ. So let that sink in as we consider those words that we just looked at earlier, Lord, is it I? And then Judas, who was betraying him, who received that piece of bread, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? Now notice earlier the disciples said, Lord, is it I? Jesus, uh, Judas calls him teacher. Rather than calling him Lord, he calls him teacher. Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. And it's interesting, as we looked at it last week, we know that Judas, of course, had gone out and worked with the, uh, the religious leaders, and he said, what will you give me if I betray him, if I deliver him into your hands? And you remember there, uh, they gave him 30 pieces of silver. But remember also, as we considered last week, there was that act of worship where uh, we, a few days earlier, Jesus had been in the home of uh, Martha and Lazarus and Mary, and as they were there eating and having a good time together, remember she had broken open the spikenard and she anointed Jesus. And Jesus said, she anointed me for my burial. She's worshiping. And remember the, the hubbub at the table was, well, that was a whole year's salary. That, that could have been sold and given to the poor. Such a noble cause. And as we consider that last week, you know, thinking of a whole year's salary, trying to just put some f- frame on this so that we can understand it. If we called a year's salary $50,000, which is low by today's standards, but that little vial of perfume that she broke and anointed Jesus' head with and his body, that that was a year's salary, we'll call it $50,000, and Judas goes now and betrays the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. The Old Testament tells us that as you consider all the rules and the regulations that God had given to the people, One of those was, if your ox gores your neighbor's slave, you owe your neighbor 30 pieces of silver so he can buy a new slave. It was was slave money. And if we considered 20 or 30 pieces of silver, by today's standards, let's just call it $30. $50,000 to worship Jesus or $30 to betray him. What kind of contrast is that? And yet here is Judas uh, having betrayed the Lord for such a small price. Someone wrote this, Christ must be sold cheap that he might be the more clear to the souls, excuse me, the more dear to the souls of the redeemed. Jesus essentially betrayed or sold for 30 pieces of silver. So as they were eating, verse 26, Jesus took bread, this is the Passover meal, blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So as they sat down to this Passover meal and they were going through the evening and each part of the meal had significance. Jesus took this bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. So he began to distribute distribute it to them. And as he gave it to them, normally this just would have been bread and it was a, a part of the meal. It was a part of the ceremony. But in this particular situation, now Jesus takes the Passover meal given some 3,000 or so years prior to this moment in time. And he turns it around and he says, this isn't just bread. This represents my body. And so as we, you know, come and we take the bread every time, hopefully we, we do so in a worthy and in a God-honoring way. But when we take the bread and the cup, we, we do what Jesus did. We remember that he says, this, this unleavened bread, And Jesus was the only sinless human being who has ever lived. He said, this is my body, take it and eat it. So he gives two little commands where he says, take and eat. 
And I was thinking back to when has Jesus said something similar to this? And you may remember back in chapter 11 of Matthew that Jesus spoke those words at the end of the chapter. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Take from me and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And in that situation, Jesus said, come to me, take from me and learn from me. Now he tells his disciples, take this bread. And you see, whenever he says take to us, to anyone, that implies human responsibility. That implies we have to reach out and take it. It is the free gift of God, but we must take it. You can't take it from your parents. You can't take it from your children. You can't take it from your best friend. You have to take it from Jesus. When Jesus, Jesus interacted with, with Nicodemus there in that amazing chapter, John chapter 3, he says, you must be born again. You must take. You must eat. And when he took the cup and gave thanks, you know, in the Passover meal, there were four cups. The first cup was the cup of sanctification. The second cup was the cup of deliverance. The third cup was the cup of redemption. And the fourth cup is the cup of Hallel or the cup of praise. And during the Passover meal, they each had a significance. The cup of sanctification, God saying to the Israelites before he delivered them, you're my people, you belong to me. And in the New Testament, he said to us over and over and over, you're not your own, you're bought with a price, you belong to me. You're my people, sanctify yourselves unto me. And then he says, the cup of deliverance. This is the cup where they remembered and celebrate that God, by his almighty power, delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians. God doing what only God can do. Securing salvation, bringing deliverance to people. The third cup, we know, is the cup that Jesus took where he said, you know, this is my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. This is the cup of redemption. Jesus took this cup, the cup that God had given to them in the Passover meal to say, I've redeemed you. I've bought you back. You, you, I sent you to, Israel, to uh, Egypt to be my people. You know, we remember the story. We study this in Genesis. You know, God sent his people there and they, they grew as a nation. He was delivering them from a famine so that they could, they could grow and they could survive. But God had this divine plan. That is, they, he sent them there and then they grew. And then the first fa- Pharaoh who had given them favor died and passed on. The new Pharaoh arose and he was not sympathetic to their cause. And he was fearful that they were going to overpower him <coughs> and overtake his country. And so he became their arch enemy, their nemesis. And God, had, they, they, they grew slowly in time into an untenable situation. They wake up one day and find themselves in a situation where they are slaves and their backs are being beaten. And they're in a situation that they never thought they would be in. They went there initially many, many years early to be God's people, God giving them so to speak, a land, a place of rest and respite. And instead, it became to them a place of slavery. So the cup of deliverance, the cup of redemption, God is redeeming them back from the slave market of sin. That's what redemption means for us. We are being bought back as slaves into the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, this blood, this wine rather, is my blood, and it's the new covenant This is a new situation. Yes, it's the Passover meal, but now this speaks of me. It doesn't just speak of what God did thousands of years ago. This is current. Jesus brings it all the way to the forefront of today. This is my my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. When is that day? Revelation 21, the marriage feast of the Lamb. When one day we will all sit down with him, that is, those who have believed in his name. The Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, the tribulation saints, we will all gather around the table 
of the Lamb of God. And Jesus, knowing at this moment, now as he's sitting at this table, that what's going to take place now for the rest of the evening, he's going to be let out, he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be given over into the hands of sinful men, and of course they are going to try him illegally and convict him of crimes he never committed. They're going to crucify him, and he will die and be resurrected. And then uh, he will come and he spend time with his disciples, and then uh, he will not come back again until he comes back for his church, but he won't set foot on the earth. But then when he sets foot on the earth again, it's the, the battle of Armageddon where he comes to make everything right, to set up his eternal kingdom, uh, his thousand year reign on the earth, all of those things we've been talking about. And then as we fast forward, we go through the thousand year reign, and now we come to the time when the consummation of all things has happened, and now we sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus says, I'm, I'm looking forward to the end, to the time when we sit down together. There's a beautiful verse you should write down <coughs> and highlight in your Bible. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Christ has become for us our Passover. And you see, all of these things, folks, these are a review for us of our salvation. These may be familiar things to us, but let these things not grow cold in our hearts. Someone wrote that this new covenant can often become old to us. Sometimes we can live as if there's been no inner transformation. We may live as if there's been no true cleansing from sin. We may think and act as if there's no word of God either the Bible or in our hearts. Sometimes we can become so cold that there might be no new and close relationship with God. And these are things that as we go through them, they are to remind us of who we are, that we do have these things. We do have a transformation. We do have a cleansing from sin. There is a word of God. And this word of God is true. And we do have a new and a close relationship with God the Father through God the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. These things should remind us of that. And if there is any coldness in our hearts, then we are to be stirred up and we are to be reminded that these things are significant for us. They're just as significant for us today as they were on that night when those disciples sat around that table. Well, we come to this next part here, the stumbling, number five of six, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, isn't it interesting? Jesus knows what's coming before him. I think at this point, the disciples still don't know what's happening. But Jesus knows what's happening on this night, correct? He knows that the next steps for him are the steps that take him to the cross. So Jesus has been celebrating Passover with his disciples. He's in a celebratory mindset, and now he, he allows that to take him to a place of worship, and as they um, exit the upper room and they head out to the Garden of Gethsemane, it says, when they had sung a hymn. Now, what was it that they sang during the Passover? <clears throat> it was the Hallel Psalms, Psalm 116 through 118. I want to encourage you later to go and read Psalm 116 through 118, but I want to hit some of the highlights of what's contained there because these are words that Jesus sang looking forward, knowing what was coming in his life. And yet, he worshiped the Lord. Psalm 116, verse 3 and 4, the pains of death surrounded me. And the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Doesn't that sound like what Jesus experienced on the cross? Didn't he say 
to his father on the cross, my God, my God, why has you, have you forsaken me? Doesn't Psalm 116 verses 3 and 4, Lord, I implore you to deliver my soul, doesn't this echo what he, he spoke as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? And yet he's singing these songs to his father in worship. Still in Psalm 116 verses 8 and 9, for you have delivered my soul from death. Even before he dies on the cross, he's worshiping God, praising him for, for the, the deliverance. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from failing. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Can you imagine singing that on your deathbed? Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. Jesus praising the Lord in a, in a, in a celebratory way with jubilee in his heart. Psalm 118, you pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The faith of Jesus. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is what Jesus was singing from the table of the Passover on his way out to Gethsemane. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then he says this, God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Listen, bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. The words Jesus sings in worship to his Father on his way to the cross. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written... I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Prophecy from Zechariah, I believe. And after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. They didn't hear that last little part because they were in shock that Jesus says, all of you will be made to stumble. Peter answered and said, Lord, <clears throat> even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. I love Peter's enthusiasm. I love his faith. But this was a prideful saying. This wasn't a, a saying from faith. And Jesus says to him, assuredly, I say to you, Peter, that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Listen, and so said all the disciples. But Jesus just said, you're all going to be scattered. You know, again, I'd like to say in the face of persecution that I wouldn't crumble. But until I'm there, I don't know how it's going to go. And I pray that God would strengthen me. I pray he would strengthen you. If you ever end up in that situation, we know <clears throat> as we study Peter's situation that as he was <coughs> there watching the Lord from a distance, and we find a lot of the details in John's gospel, that a little servant girl came up to him and says, hey, aren't you one of his disciples? And even in that moment, standing, warming himself by the fire, he swears, he curses, and he says, I'm not one of them. No doubt, as we go along here, we find Peter weeping bitterly because of this denial and we pray that God might strengthen us. And as we wrap it up this morning, the prayer, the prayer in the garden. Then Jesus came and said, came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to, to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. We know that the name Gethsemane means olive press. So it's a place that they would go and press the oil out of the olives. <coughs> Jesus says to them, 
sit here while I go over there and pray. So eight of the disciples sit down. Peter, James, and John follow him a little further. And it says in verse uh, 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So now he just worshiped. Now he's looking at what's coming in front of him. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Whenever Jesus, and most of the time in the New Testament, when you see that word watch, it is talking about prayer. It is not talking about standing guard, per se, uh, to watch out for an intruder. It's watch and pray. And so Jesus here saying, watch with me, watch in prayer. He went a little further, fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You should underline this verse. This should be a prayer for us, shouldn't it? Because when we're facing things, trials, difficulties, uncertainties, things that are hard, and Jesus knew what was coming, didn't he? He knew Isaiah 53. He knew that was speaking of him. He knew Isaiah 50 said that they tore out my beard. He knew that the stripes were coming, that the welts would be laid. He knew that he would be beaten so severely, but not a bone in his body would be broken. He knew that he would be beaten beyond recognition. He knew that physically he was going to be taken to the extremities of suffering. Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. What is the cup? It's the cup of the wrath of God that was going to be poured out on him. The cup of suffering, a cup of suffering, a cup of wrath such as you and I will never know. No human being would ever know this cup except Jesus. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Listen to the resolve. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Again, just as we I want to have a resolve in our mind that Sunday is the first day of the week, not Monday. We want to have a resolve in our minds and in our hearts that our air, uh, our attitude in prayer would always be, Lord, not what I will, but what you will. <clears throat> I remember many years ago now when our son was um, had decided to go into the Marine Corps. Uh, And a similar thing actually happened when our daughter Rachel had decided to um, uh, go overseas to Hungary for a year of Bible college. Uh, we We had people speaking to us in both of those situations saying, how can you let your kids do that? How can you let your daughter go so far away from home to a foreign country in in Europe, uh, uh, you know, where you don't know where, where they are and what they're doing. And how can you let your son sign up for the military? I mean, he might get killed. He could lose his life. And in our family, you know, hopefully the same as in yours, you know, we pray. And we, we tried to shepherd our kids through this. You know, they were adults. They were making their own decisions. But we said, you know, we want you to pray. We want you to seek the Lord. We want you to be saying things like this. Lord, what is your will for my life? Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And we had God's peace in both of those situations, knowing that he was leading them. And and we were confirming it in our own hearts and our own prayer lives before the Lord. These are things that God did. And so we were able to say to those people, and many of them were believers who said these things to us, the best place for them to be is where God wants them to be. The safest place for them to be is where God wants them to be. And you're like, but my grandkids are overseas now. I know, but that's where God wants them to be. Do I want them to be here with me so that I can watch them grow up and read them stories and bounce them on my knee? I do. We ache for that. But God's plan is that they be there. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said, Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Peter, you're the leader. You're setting the tone here. You're, you're sleeping. 
again, one of the reasons I don't like to read this is so many times I've sat down to pray and woken up going, what did I pray for? <laughs> I don't remember. Surely we've all fallen asleep in prayer. But prayer is a time when we are communing with the Lord. In this situation, the Lord said, could you not pray with me, Peter? Don't you have my back? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Remember, Peter, I just said. Now, Luke's gospel tells us, Peter, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. If I had heard those words, I would probably be horrified and terrified, and hopefully I would be on my knees praying and shaking. And yet here is Peter, not even concerned. He's falling asleep. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a verse you should underline. Let us have no confidence in the flesh. The spirit may be willing, but the flesh is always weak, isn't it? This is always the case. Paul says in Romans 8 that he longs for the day that his um, redeemed, unredeemed flesh will be merged with his redeemed mortality. Until then, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. God, whatever you will. James tells us in his epistle, you should always say, rather than saying, Lord, you know, I'm going to go to this place and do this or that and make a profit and all of that. And he says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do these things. Very similar idea to what Jesus prayed here. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. We have this beautiful verse in Hebrews chapter 12. Let me read it to you, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured all of these things for joy. Jesus knew Isaiah 53, but he also knew that there was joy on the other side of that. Jesus knew that God had this cup for him to drink from, and he was the only one who could drink it, and yet he worshiped the Lord heading into it. He's like, I'm walking into battle, I'm walking into the worst day of my life. You know, sometimes you see people post this stuff on social media, right? Worst day ever. Oh no, this is the worst day. Don't even listen to that baloney. Just keep swiping. Passover and prayer. Let these things sink into us. Let these things renew us. Let these things encourage us. You see, so often when we face trials, when we face difficulties, we need to see them for what they are, not for some gigantic mountain. Isn't that the way it always happens in our mind? There's this, this thing, and it's like, oh my gosh, there's a mountain. You know what? There are bumps in the road. When we compare what we go through in life to what Jesus did for us, is anything ever that difficult? How many times have you been called to die for the sins of the world? You see, the things we, we have to endure so much of it is just because of the fallenness of the world. But even if we have to suffer a little bit for our faith, even the scriptures say, and you may have, I think Peter wrote these words, even if you have to suffer for a little while, it's nothing. If Paul and Melanie and what they're doing end up one day, their church gets raided because they're, I mean, Amman Jordan, right? Again, Islam central. If one day somebody comes in and they go, hey, you, you're, you're, you're subverting Islam. You're telling someone to worship someone other than Allah. Or they go in there, they're planting a church in Iraq. 
And they're there doing that. And then someone comes along and arrests them. They get beaten and they get put in prison and, and worse. Maybe they get executed for their faith. You see, th- this is reality, not the stuff we deal with here. Oh my gosh, gas went up three cents. This is terrible. What's terrible is dying for the sins of the world. What's terrible is drinking the cup of wrath. The stuff we have here, this is just a bump in the road. It's just a little, it's just a little something. As I think about what Jesus was going through this night, the words of James 1 come to mind. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect completing work, maturing work, that you may be complete, lacking in nothing. You see, every time we go through something difficult, rather than complain, we should be saying, Lord, what, you, what's in, what, what is this? What are you taking me through? And not my will, but yours. And Lord, use this for your glory and let this, you know, whatever this thing is I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing, this challenge, this difficulty. Lord, I don't know how you do these things, but turn it around for your glory. I don't want to be here all self-absorbed and self-focused. Oh, woe is me. My job stinks. My life stinks. My, my wife or my husband stink and blah, 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 blah. You know what? God's put you there. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to learn. He wants you to grow. We are to look to heaven. We are to draw our eyes to Jesus. Not to fixate on our problems and our difficulties. We look unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. Why? Because for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and the suffering. Jesus is our example in all things. Whatever you're going through, and I don't mean to minimize your pain and your suffering if you're going through something very deep like this family that we've been talking about and praying for. But God is the only one who can take what is evil and turn it for good, isn't he? Until we see him face to face, 90% of what we go through, 99%, we're not going to understand. And that means we have to trust him. We have to have faith. Father, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, as we come to your table this morning, we just thank you that you've given us of your son. You've given us of yourself so freely, Lord. And our complaining is nothing. Lord, you, uh, you want us to trust you. You want us to look to you. And so this morning as we, we sing a song and we, <clears throat> we just consider what you've done for us, Lord. We humble ourselves before you. We say, Lord, give me that kind of heart. Give me that kind of attitude. Uh, you, you said in speaking to your disciples that in that day, when you're challenged, you'll be given words to speak. Lord, we believe that's not just for them, that's for us. And so, Lord, we don't want to walk around in fear thinking, well, what if I deny you? Lord, just we're going to trust you that when the opportunity comes that we can speak on, on, on your behalf, that we can speak the name of Jesus, that we will. And we're going to let the chips fall where they may because it's far more important to confess you before men that you might confess us before your Father than for us to deny you before men because we're afraid. The fear of man brings a snare, but the fear of God brings wholesomeness and life. Lord, give us that holy reverence in our lives. Lord, if there's any among us this morning as we've considered these things and they're thinking, Lord, I, I don't know what all this stuff is. I've never believed. Let this become for them that moment where they turn to you and they say, Lord, I don't understand it, but Lord, come into my life. Cleanse me of my sin. Redeem me, Lord. And knowing in that moment you will do so. And this morning, if you're seeking the Lord, then do that right now in your heart and he will enter in. And for us, Lord, as we come to your table, we come in spirit and in truth and we worship you. And we celebrate who you are. Because just as you endured things for the joy set before you, so we will do so in our lives. These bumps in the road are nothing more than that compared. Uh, Paul even said it, you know, these things are nothing compared to the exceeding weight of eternal glory that lies before us. And so, Lord, we look unto you this morning. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. 
We love you. We trust you. We turn to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the men are going to serve communion here. If you're at home, hopefully you have your communi- communion elements. We're going to sing a song of praise. Uh, Pastor Mitch will come up and lead us to the table, and then we'll be dismissed. <laughs>